Goi Sai. Hello. <laughs> good afternoon. Everybody's feeling good? The food hasn't started hitting you too much yet? You're still okay? Good. So my at scale or smart devices powered by the cloud. But what exactly are these smart devices we talk about? Well, you have seen some examples today. So let's recap on the devices still. So all kind of devices, your refrigerators, coffee machines, wearable, etc. are connecting to the internet. But are they really smart? Well, usually not. Usually the devices themselves are not that smart. <laughs> Because they are quite small, they have to be cheap, right? So the processors and everything are quite small. The, really the internet of things boom started with the Arduino boards. That was really the kind of beginning and genesis of connecting everything, programmatically controlling these with the microcontrollers and then connecting ultimately to the internet. So, but when you look at the microcontrollers, like the typical Arduino and even the Raspberry Pi, okay, now there's a new stronger model, but still, the microcontrollers that usually companies use to control and connect the devices are individually not that strong. So they're not really powerful computers. But they're really handy at controlling the devices. So with these microcontrollers, you can do a lot of interesting things with your physical world. So you can connect sensors, you can sense things, you can connect actuators and motors to move things around. Or you can move the device. You can make it fly or swim or roll on the ground. But there are challenges. So if you are in the business of IoT, you will have, when you're successful, millions of devices that are connected, pumping data somewhere, and then you also need to connect to them, you need to manage them. So millions of devices times millions of customers if you're successful. So millions of customers using those devices, consuming the data maybe from the devices. So millions times millions, by definition, it's a highly distributed system at very large scale. So you need to be able to handle that. And Internet of Things really requires no limits anywhere. If you have a bottleneck, you're dead. You don't scale. <laughs> That's where the cloud helps. Well, what is the cloud? It's many things, but when it comes to Internet of Things, the cloud will provide, for example, unlimited memory and unlimited compute. So what do you get when you have really a lot of memory and a huge amount of compute capacity at your disposal? You have a very large brain in effect. So what you can do is that you can complement the solution of IoT, those millions of devices connected to the central system and have the cloud or your applications, your workloads in the cloud with the unlimited capacity be the central brain. Now in some scenarios, in the IoT world, you will have something like mesh networks where maybe multiple IoT devices, maybe drones will talk to each other and figure out what to do. Yes, that's one scenario. But in many cases, what really works is that you have the little devices on the edge of the network connected to the internet. Maybe they have sensors like temperature sensor, uh, thermometer, accelerometer, whatever. And then they send the sensor data over the sensor network somewhere to the central nervous system and the brain. Just like the human body, you have sensors in your fingers. If you touch something hot, the sensor sends the signal through the nervous system to the brain to analyze. The brain is, oh, oh, something is happening. Con command and control after the analytics and decision and insight and sends the command back, in this case, to another motor, your muscle, and you move your hand. You can do the same using the cloud as the brain. So really briefly introducing our company, Amazon Web Services. The really the main point of Amazon Web Services is utility computing. In the old days, you had to buy boxes if you wanted to run any applications. How many boxes do you need? Well, you don't know because you don't know how much traffic you will have. You will not know how many users you have. When you buy boxes, you have to wait for them for months. They cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's upfront capital investment in the belief that your new service will be successful. That's like a hundred years ago when companies needed to build a power station to power their factories. Then the national grid came. Electricity became a utility, readily available. You just plug into a wall socket, standardized, easy to use, cheap, readily available. If you need more electricity, you don't have to buy more boxes. You just consume it 
and it's paper use. When you stop using electricity, the bill goes to zero when you switch off the lights. So Amazon Web Services does the same to IT. We have modernized the IT infrastructure and platforms. You don't have to buy boxes anymore. You consume the IT infrastructure and services like electricity. No commitment, no capital investment, simply paper use. So we have core services like simple compute, storage, networking, and then higher order services that automate. painful thing in IT and we turn it into an easy to consume paper use service. And when we talk about IoT at scale, you need to have a backend system that scales if you go to the millions of devices successful IoT solutions. So this, there's a really interesting data point from Gartner. This is the latest Gartner Magic Quadrant for cloud providers. We are really happy that we are in the leaders quadrant there. But the interesting thing about scale is that according to Gartner, the AWS cloud in production is over five times larger than all the other cloud providers combined. So that gives interesting economies of scale, how we can provide the services so cost efficiently, but also it means that the AWS cloud does not run out of capacity. So let's take a look at some of our customers running IoT solutions in production on AWS. The first one is GE, General Electric. So GE, have, for example, turbines. So for the GE turbines, what they do is that they have equipped them with a lot of sensors. They stream the data from the GE turbines to the AWS cloud. They use the massive capacity there to run artificial intelligence analytics on the data. And they optimize the parameters of the turbines. Even a 1% efficiency gain on a large turbine like this is a massive business win. So then they send the optimized parameters back to the turbine. The next one is Nest. Nest makes this really cool learning thermostat. Well, actually, the thermostat, it's really nice. It's glass and machined aluminum. It's really beautiful, but it's a dummy box. It's just a pretty box. All the smarts, all the brains are, in, are running in the applications in the cloud. The next one is Illumina. It's the world's most popular DNA sequencing machine. And rather than building a supercomputer inside each of these sequencers, which would be really expensive and quite large, they simply have a scanner here that scans the sample and then streams the data to the AWS cloud where they store it durably, they analyze, do the DNA sequencing with massive compute capacity. They also provide the user interface services from there. So basically, they, make, they can make the box a lot cheaper and they can sell more, a lot more of those. They don't run out of capacity. And DNA sequencing is massively computationally heavy. The next customer running IoT on AWS is NASA. So you all know the Curiosity Mars rover roaming around. Curiosity is sending, it has a lot of sensors, obviously. The whole point of Curiosity is sensors. So all the data that Curiosity is collecting on Mars is streamed through the deep space network of NASA to JPL in Pasadena, California, and immediately uploaded to AWS. They store the data from Mars on Amazon S3, our storage service with 11 nines of durability. Because if they lose the data they get from Mars, that's it. They, <laughs> you, don't, you get it once, that data. You don't want to lose the data. And then they use the capacity of the, the compute capacity in the cloud to do quickly analysis of what Curiosity is doing because they faster, the faster they analyze the situation of curiosity, the faster they can send the command back to curiosity what to do next. When they can do this anal analytics and science decision faster, they can do more science with curiosity. There's a 14 minute round trip delay between Earth and Mars. You can't drive curiosity with a joystick. So you have to collect the data, analyze quickly, send the command back. That cycle has to be fast. The next one is Dropcam. It's a really nice webcam you can buy. Just drop it in, connect it to your Wi-Fi, and it starts working. But did you know that Dropcam is the largest, the largest internet uploading service in the world? So Dropcam is uploading more data per minute than YouTube. When they moved from their legacy system to AWS, they completely removed the limitations and bottlenecks of ingesting and storing and analyzing the data from all their cameras. So, so they grew like crazy. So now they have petabytes of data and billions of events. Dropcam is not just storing the data from the videos from the cameras in the cloud. 
They are also doing things like computer vision algorithms. So to drop cam, the video feed from the customer cameras is not just data to be, to be stored, it's information to be analyzed. So the drop cam can provide services like, hey drop cam, a customer can say, send me an alarm if my dog is on the table eating my lunch. <laughs> or send me an alarm if my daughter comes home from school with more than one friend, because then it's a party, so that's bad. <laughs> So you get the idea. They use the power of the cloud not just to store, but also to analyze the information for more value. Then there's the climate cooperation. They provide insurance to farmers. So if there's too much rain, mm, it's bad. If there's not enough rain, mm, it's bad again. So they need to analyze what is likely going to happen and then provide insurance based on that. So they collect a lot of data, millions and billions of data. And ultimately, they have over 5 trillion data points to analyze, to make these predictive models. And to do the simulations and analytics, they run regularly 5 to 6,000 node Hadoop clusters on the AWS cloud. But they need to maybe run it only for one hour. And then the analysis is done. You're done. You get the business result. Do you want to keep 6,000 servers running one hour per day, 23 hours doing nothing? and then depreciating. Where do you put 6,000 servers? Do you have staff to manage 6,000 servers? I don't think so. So that's why using the cloud, they can simply provision as many servers as they need to run the job. When the job is over, they simply throw them away. Throw them away, disposable infrastructure. So they do simulations. If you want to do IoT, if you want to have a solution at scale, you probably want to test your system before you actually get to large scale. You don't want to have millions of devices to do your testing. What you can do is uh, replace the clients and the customers with simulators. Run those in servers in the cloud, for example. You can do functional testing really cheap with just one server. When you need to do a performance test, capacity test of millions, for example, you can run thousands of servers generating the load and then go back to one or just none. And just like electricity, when you switch off the resources in the cloud, the, cl the bill goes to zero. Zero. You don't pay for electricity in a rack. You don't pay for data center maintenance, etc. So let's look at IoT devices at scale then. This is one of my personal favorites. We have a lot of software development kits on the AWS platform so that the developers can develop on different languages. And now our latest SDK is a C language SDK specifically for Arduino compatible IoT devices. It's open source, it's on GitHub, you can download it from there and you can even contribute, it, contribute to it if you want. So the point of this SDK is that on the IoT devices like the Intel, Galileo, Edison, Arduino, Spark for example and many others, you can run the SDK and communicate with the AWS backend services directly. You don't need a three-tier architecture with devices, then some servers talking to the devices, and then your services in the backend like analytics. No, two-tier architecture. Millions of devices, each of them connecting in parallel, horizontally scaling directly to the cloud backend services, unlimited scale. And then, of course, the SDK helps you with things like security, so authenticating, authorizing access, access control, key management, encryption, etc. Whether it's for tele telemetry, sending data from the device to the backend system, who is this device, what can it do, or command and control, controlling the device. So security is really important. When you use the SDK, one line of code to connect to the cloud services, and all these security things are automated by the SDK. So then you connect your device securely to the cloud, you start getting data. You might get a lot of data. Without going into the details, in the platform, we have a range of big data services, both for offline and real time, for ingesting, storing, analyzing all the data at any scale. One of the ones that's really important here in IoT is Amazon Kinesis, what we launched last year. It's a streaming data service, real time streaming data service. You can connect millions of data producers, any number, into Amazon Kinesis, pump any amount of data into Kinesis, the service, you don't have to manage your own message queue or something. How do you make your own message queue scalable and highly available? Hmm. So you just use Kinesis. When you pump data into Kinesis at any volume, Kinesis will replicate all the data records across, across at least three data centers in the same country you choose. It doesn't drop a single record. 
And on the other side of Kinesis, you can have multiple applications consuming the data stream and then analyzing it in real time. And now I'd like to show you a demo. It's easy to have slides, but I've actually <laughs> built a little system. You may have been wondering what's on the table here, so let me show you. <laughs> I have a real IoT demo. And in this demo, I'm using the Arduino, of course. It's the kind of mother of IoT boards. So I use the Arduino Yun. I'm going to show it to you soon. Look at this. In the Arduino Yun product, that's the actual logo of the product. Yun means cloud, like most of you know. So why does this Arduino board have cloud in the name? Because it's the first Arduino board that has Wi-Fi built in. So it's easily internet connected. The next device that I use is an Arduino compatible or Arduino clone called Spark, Spark Core. It's really tiny, really cheap, it's only $10. It's really cool, super small chip, and it's really easy to use. So in my demo, this demo here that you will see soon, I have the Arduino Yun, and on, to the Arduino Yun I have connected a sensor, an accelerometer. So the point of this demo is an earthquake detection network. <laughs> So the accelerometer is going to sense if there's an earthquake. The Arduino is reading the sensor. It's really good at that. Then it's also going to display the sensor reading in an analog format. You will see that soon. And then the Arduino, because it has Wi-Fi, it's pumping the data that it's reading from the 